All right, so uh, welcome again to our geophysics and tectonics seminar this week. I'm excited to announce that our speaker this week uh, is Elvira uh, Mulyakova uh, from Yale University. Sorry if I messed up the name. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, whose uh, title of the talk today is A Dislocation in the Grain Boundary Walk into a Bar. Um, and so to find out the punchline, uh, Elvira, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kili. Um, thanks everyone for coming to the seminar. Um, again, thanks for organizers for putting together this uh, great seminar series. That's been a lot of fun to follow. Um, so yeah, I'll just jump right in. Like Kili already said, please feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, this is still a format we're all getting used to. I cannot see you, so I can't judge by your faces whether or not you're confused or you're following or if you're laughing at my jokes, you know, so please speak up if you, uh, if you like it. Um, all right, so let me just get this uh, going. So starting with my title slide, this is just to set the scene a little bit. Um, what you're looking at here are really the tiny grains that make up the rocks in this case. Uh, this is one of the rocks we find abundantly in the mantle. This is a uh, um, 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 magnesium bustite. Um, and this is just to remind you that for the next 40, 45 minutes or so, um, we'll be kind of spending our time thinking about really the smallest uh, processes or we've been spending time on this very small um, length scale, but thinking about some of the geological processes that hopefully we're a little more familiar with, um, things that have to do with lithospheric deformation and plate tectonics, so forth. But I thought before we dive in into this really a tiny scales, um, I'm going to take you on a little thought experiment. Um, so we're going to start far, far out in outer space. And I want you to imagine that you're an alien and extraterrestrial creature who are, you know, flying in from space and happened upon our solar system. And what you're looking for is a planet to inhabit, either to find new friends or just to live there, or maybe you're looking for a victim find your favorite alien avatar and you're in our solar system and you're looking for your next habitable planet. Now, the only thing you can look at is the surface, but luckily you've taken a course on, um, you know, um, habitable planets. So you sort of know what, you, um, what you're looking for. And the first planet you happen upon is Mercury. So you're looking at its surface and it looks pretty still, pretty cold. You see that this um, planet has seen a lot of history. It suffered some impacts. You also see some, um, I'll point with my cursor here, um, some blue and red lines. These are marking some extensional and contractional features. So this planet has seen some geological history, uh, but it looks pretty geologically dead right now. So maybe not the best place to settle. Next, as you keep on flying, you come upon Mars. Now, this maybe looks like it's seen some more varied uh, tectonic activity. You see some volcanoes there, some somewhat recent, but also a lot of old volcanoes, um, some craters. Um, but again, the surface of this planet looks pretty still, so maybe not the best place to stop either. Venus, now this is a planet that's somewhat more active. Um, you also see some ridges, some mountain belts even. Uh, a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of very recently in place lavas, but the conditions on this planet don't look too uh, hospitable for life either, so maybe not the best place to stop. And then you come to Earth. Now this planetary surface looks very different. And the first thing that strikes you is that this surface of this planet is continuously moving. Um, it's, um, you can see how it's subdivided into plates that are inter, and in between those plates, you have this interconnected networks. And these are the plate boundaries along which these plates are moving. There's liquid water at the surface. There is a atmosphere that's keeping the temperature nice and stable. There is a magnetic field around this planet um, that is protecting it from solar radiation. And overall, the surface of this planet looks to be moving at a sluggish, um, sort of uh, stable pace um, and um, a lot of biological activity on it. So perhaps this would be the place to stop. So you're thinking I could maybe live here. 
So this is just to um, sort of with this little thought experiment to think how our planet is quite different from a lot of our neighbors, a lot of our rocky neighbors. And a lot of um, sort of what we experience as, as we live here, as we see the evolution of life and plants here, um, is thanks to the uh, geological activity that is taking place. And this geological activity, most of it is really focused to um, what we see as tectonic plate boundaries. This is where we see a lot of our uh, volcanoes um, occurring. This is where new mantle material, for example, at the mid-ocean ridges is where new mantle material is being brought to the surface. Uh, and these minerals are interacting with the oceans at the surface or with the atmospheric elements. Um, and um, generally, what we think of, when we think of geological activity on our planet, we tend to think about uh, the motion of tectonic plates and tectonic plate boundaries. Now, another very illustrative way to think about it is if you look at the surface of our planet, and let's say to begin with, you don't really know where the plate boundaries are, but you're tracking where this, um, where most of your action, geological action is concentrated. So let's say you could, for example, be tracking um, earthquakes. Um, so here I'm showing some of the worldwide earthquakes that happened um, in a day, and here they're happening in a week, and here they're happening over a month. So you can really see that a lot of geological activity, seismic activity in this case, if you connect the dots, they really delineate uh, where our tectonic plate boundaries are. So really, um, just to sort of highlight that point, a lot of what we think is geological activity on our planet is taking place at uh, tectonic plate boundaries. Now, the theory of plate tectonics truly revolutionized how we think about geoscience. Now, plate tectonics itself, what we, um, what we understand by it is that the surface, the solid part of the surface of our planet is subdivided into plates that are strong in their interior um, and that are moving relative to each other. So this is as illustrated here. Um, it's sort of like rigid plates that are um, moving along the surface of our planet. And most of that motion is concentrated in this narrow localized zones that are the plate boundaries. And one of the reasons it really kind of uh, revolutionized how we think about any geological activity is because this allows us once we see the kinematics of the plates at the surface, this allows us to, first of all, predict where um, the geologically active uh, places are gonna be, like the regions of earthquakes uh, or volcanoes. It also allows us to um, turn back the clock and see where um, various continents were earlier in the Earth's history, how various geological units have been emplaced at the Earth's surface. So this is um, an extremely helpful uh, theory that sort of underlies a lot of, um, a lot of geological sciences today. Um, however, like I mentioned, this is a kinematic model. So plate tectonics describes how the plates move today, um, but it doesn't necessarily um, explain why they move in a particular way. And it is somewhat limiting in that sense in that if we don't um, until we know the dynamics of plate tectonics, we can't easily uh, generalize it and try to explain, for example, why don't other planets, including our neighboring rocky planets, do not have plate tectonics, or when did plate tectonics start on Earth, um, and questions like that. In order to address questions like that, we really need to dive into the dynamics and the physics as to why plates move the way they do and what forms the plate boundaries. So um, a lot of progress, of course, has been made um, about this um, topic. And um, we know at this point that the plate motions at the surface is really a manifestation of the mantle convection in our planetary interior. And here in a very simplified animation um, that I'm showing here, the way we think about motion of tectonic plates at the surface now is that um, Earth's interior that is much hotter, um, deeper down, so here's the core mantle boundary. Um, the material that's closest to the core um, or is deepest is hot and therefore buoyant and so it rises to the surface, 
once at the surface it cools and densifies or contracts um, and then sinks uh, back into the mantle. So this effect of thermal currents or I mean, of course, the mantle convection is somewhat more complicated than that. But in general, um, you have upwelling motion of hotter material and downwelling motion of colder material. And um, this largely captures a lot of what we see that hot material is coming up, like at mid-ocean ridges, cold material is going down, um, say, in the regions of subduction, where old cold plates go down. Um, so here's one way to think about it is, is that when a new plate is being formed, for example, here at the mid-ocean ridges, as it cools, um, as it ages, uh, it becomes denser and eventually it should sink. However, we know about the Earth's rocks that cooling has um, another effect in that material that is colder is also stiffer. Um, perhaps an intuitive example, how one can think about it is the same as um, like honey. If you are making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you put some peanut butter on it, you put honey on it. If you then forget and put your honey instead of on the shelf, you put it in the fridge, you take it out later, it's a lot colder. So next time you're making a sandwich, it's a lot more difficult to spread it on top of your bread. So rocks are kind of the same, but less delicious. Um, they're just um, sort of the stiffening effect on other planets has this uh, consequence that the plates that are cooling and want to sink because they're denser struggle to deform just because they're so strong to give in to this uh, buoyancy driven force or this buoyant, uh, buoyancy forces and sink. So they kind of stay at the surface for a long time. Something must be occurring differently on Earth in that our plates, as they cool and densify, do manage to somehow be weak enough to sink. So something is offsetting the stiffening effect. And uh, one of the biggest questions in our uh, community today is what, is what are the physics that are allowing our rocks to be weak enough to sink? So this brings me to, the, these are some of the big questions that are driving my research, uh, which is um, which is what I'm be talking in more detail today. So we'll be talking about two different timescales. One is um, sort of longer time scale, the time scale of mantle convection, formation of plate boundaries, and really preserving plate boundaries, um, plate boundary weakness to allow our plates to be continuously moving and for our surface to be in this dynamic state. Um, and we'll also talk about some of the shorter time scale phenomena. And this is really one of the strengths of addressing these questions at the fundamental physics scale as to what governs uh, or what controls rock deformation in that we can then address questions um, having to do with planetary evolution time scale and also shorter transient time scales, um, for example, those controlling earthquake cycles something us humans um, would be um, kind of more intuitively familiar with. All right. So as a starting, just to bring us all on the same page, what is a rock and how does it deform? So a rock is really just a, um, here, what I'm showing here is just a bunch of atoms or molecules that are brought together and organized in a neat way, uh, what we describe as a crystal lattice. So these are well-ordered rows and columns of atoms that are organized together. Now, um, it's not all perfect because they have defects within this crystalline lattice of arrangement with you know, regular spacings between each atom or molecule. And these defects um, have various um, scales. So the smallest type of defects we typically think about are the point defects. And that's where, you know, within your crystalline lattice, you'll have an atom missing, for example. Um, you also have some larger defects, and I'll be talking a lot about these. Um, these are dislocations. This is when you can envision that a whole row or column of atoms is missing from a lattice. And finally, there are these planar defects. Now, when we talk about grains or crystals, these are three-dimensional features. So we're really talking about blobs of well-organized um, atoms or molecules. And one blob is separated from another blob by a grain boundary. So think of two 
different crystalline lattices that are identical, but are sort of tilted relative to each other and separated by a plane that is a grain boundary. And it is also, also a form of defect um, in a polycrystalline rock. So more formally, the smaller defects we know as vacancies, linear defects we call the dislocations, and grain boundaries are these planar large-scale defects. And as the rock, you know, regardless of whether the rock is deforming or not, all of these defects are in constant motion and in constant evolution that is also coupled to each other. So we have vacancies moving around, all driven by the fact that the rock just wants to lower its internal energy. So vacancies are moving around, dislocations are moving around and grain boundaries, and they're all moving from one to another. Dislocations can generate new vacancies or they can form new grain boundaries and so forth. Um, so we'll be thinking about the combined effect, mostly about dislocations and grain boundaries in this case, um, to sort of understand, starting with the smaller scale, what are the physical properties of the rock and how these defects um, control the, say, deformation properties of strength of the rock. Um, there's a beautiful quote here by Sir Frederick Charles Frank that I think captures this uh, kind of idea of defects quite well. It says that crystals are like people. It is the defects in them that make them interesting. All right, so um, sort of some, uh, um, some of the terms or terminology that uh, I'll be using a lot. Like I mentioned, whether or not the rock is deforming, the defects um, are sort of moving and evolving. When the rock is deforming, there are different uh, type of defects that can be accommodating the associated strain. When it's the smallest ones, the vacancies that are moving around, uh, we typically call it the diffusion creep. So it's a diffusive like process where high concentration of vacancies would uh, go along its gradient uh, towards a lower concentration of vacancies. So atoms are moving around from point to point. That's diffusion creep. When we talk about dislocation creep, these are these linear defects that are accommodating strains. So when there's a stress acting on the rock, uh, dislocations will move so as to um, relax some of that stress. And that's what we call the dislocation creep. And as um, these various defects are moving around, the grain boundaries will be continuously rearranging. Um, for example, in the process of grain growth. So as one crystal um, grows into another crystal, um, or if there's a lot of dislocations um, that can be combined to form a new grain boundary, sort of a lot of rearrangement of the crystalline structure of the grain geometry has to do with the migration of the grain boundaries. And if you'd like to learn more in sort of very informal, very accessible language about um, evolution of rocks from the point of view of defect, um, feel free to read this blog that I wrote a while ago um, called Atoms on the Move. Sort of how we think about a rheology of rocks. Somebody's not muted. Um, how we think about the uh, rheology of rocks on the scale of atoms. Um, all right, so to put it all in sort of um, um, in a more, uh, in a larger scale organized picture, when we talk about the strength of the rock, um, we can think of it as how do various defects respond to changes in stress or to changes in temperature or to changes in grain size. I'm showing you one way how this can be um, somewhat, uh, well here qualitatively, but also quantitatively described um, in a sort of diagram that here on the y axis, I have stress on the x axis is temperature. But in reality, of course, this kind of diagram would have uh, multiple dimensions uh, like grain size, presence of water, uh, composition or chemical impurities as a, the, a lot of additional axes here. But just as an example, we can, for example, say knowing how dislocations respond to the stress that is acting on the rock, um, we know when um, at what conditions, temperature and stress, are dislocations dominant in accommodating strain or at what conditions are vacancies or diffusion creep dominant at accommodating strain. Now, when we have this physical understanding for how defects respond to um, 
to these deformation conditions like temperature and stress, we can also flip that question um, the other way around because when we go out in the field and we collect our rock samples, what we can look at are the defects. We can look at the grain size or the, which are then the grain boundaries or the concentrations of dislocation densities. And what would, we would really like to do is to be able to go out in the field, look at the microstructure and try to infer the deformation conditions from that. This is um, again to remind you that one of the um, motivating questions for this, uh, for this um, uh, work uh, is to be able to look at environments where of tectonic plate boundaries and try to infer the conditions as to what allows them to be weak or what allows them to be um, uh, to localize shear or strain. And um, so this type of um, uh, mapping from looking at the microstructure and inferring deformation conditions uh, has been um, done or it's a, sort of something that geologists do quite regularly. I'm showing you one example here is how we can use the understanding of, um, um, of microstructural defects uh, to interpret more kind of larger scale uh, physical conditions. So I'm showing you examples of some of the uh, rock samples that have been collected from what we call the exposed plate boundaries at the Earth's surface. So here um, are two different uh, ophiolites, uh, some in Europe, these two. And this one is in Oman. And what can, you can see is that, for example, starting on the right here, is that rocks that have not seen too much deformation or relatively little deformed, these tend to have larger grain sizes. While as you go towards region where, um, where rocks have seen a lot more deformation, you see much smaller grain sizes. So here, um, what we call the myelonites or strongly reduced grain size. And some extremely deformed rocks, this could be, for example, at the very um, center of a shear zone um, that we call the ultramyelonites. So rocks that have seen most strain, or we could say arguably the weakest rocks are the ones who have the smallest uh, grain sizes. So this is one way where we can look at the microstructure and say, these rocks appear to be the weakest and have deformed the most. These rocks appear to be stronger with larger grains and appear to have deformed the least. Um, this sort of mapping um, has been used uh, in kind of an approach that we call a piezometer. So a piezometer is what I refer to when you look at some uh, quantity. In this case, it can be grain size or dislocation density. And you're trying to infer stress, because this is a piezometer, from um, looking at the grain size or the dislocation density. So let me start uh, on the left here. This is a compilation of a lot of deformation experiments uh, where the rock is being deformed, it reaches a steady state, and then you observe the distribution of grain sizes within your deformed sample, and you know which stress you've been deforming it at. So you can see how the rocks that have been deformed at the highest stress have the smallest grain size. And the rocks that have been deformed at the lowest stress have the uh, largest grain size. So once you have this type of map, you can then look at your geological samples from the field and try to see what stress does your observed grain size correspond to. You can see there is some scatter in this plot just because stress is, of course, not the only uh, parameter that affects the grain size. There's also effect of temperature, uh, fluids, and other, other things. Um, very similarly, you can go out in the field and measure your dislocation density. Or, I'm sorry, you can start with your experiment, deform your rock. This is the data I'm showing here. It's a compilation of decades of work of deformation experiments. And you can see how at the smallest stress, you have very low dislocation density. At the highest stress, you have higher dislocation density. And it appears that dislocation density um, behaves sort of like a power law or scales uh, as stress to a power. Um, typically, one assumes two, but could be something smaller. And so one can then, again, use that by looking at the sample from your field and measuring its dislocation density and try to infer the stress. Um, dislocation density piezometer seems um, a little less um, kind of somewhat more reliable in that there's a lot less scatter. So it doesn't seem to be as 
or doesn't seem to depend on anything else but stress. It's these uh, experiments that I'm showing here have been done at different um, different temperatures, for example, different dry or wet conditions. So dislocation density seems to be a more uh, kind of reliable measure of stress. There are, however, some limitations. Um, Elvira, there's, yes. a, there's a question from Elizabeth um, just asking, are you looking at all mafic rocks or across different compositions? Uh, great question. Uh, so I'm mostly interested in mafic rocks just because these are kind of lower lithosphere, upper mantle. Um, so because when we are thinking about what forms or how to form tectonic plate boundaries, it is really the deeper layers that are the bottleneck to deformation. So the strongest part of the plate would be lower lithosphere, upper mantle, um, and so mafic or dramatic rocks. Uh, however, a lot of the experiments um, or a lot of the field samples that we have access to also involve crustal rocks, more quartz switch rocks. Um, and so we, we do want to take advantage of those data as well, just because a lot of the physics that are governing um, the kind of the strength of these rocks are similar. Um, so, you know, when I look at different piezometers, I would I would try to be aware that the compositions are different, um, but I can see a lot of similarity between uh, both mafic and um, kind of crust rocks. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I guess I was curious on this particular um, uh, graphs that we're looking at, are those, are the values that plotted, do they come from olivine or do they come from quartz or do they come from a mix? A great question. So I think these are, um, Olivine, the two, um, and I, I'm pretty, so for the grain size, uh, this kind of collection of data, um, I, I want to say that all of these are olivine, I would need to double check, but I'm pretty sure most of these are olivine or maybe pyroxenes. Uh, for the dislocation density piezometer, these are all olivines. Um, um, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, Thanks for the question. Um, so one other yeah. question about um, what's the best way to measure the dislocation density while you're still on these graphs? Oh, great question. Okay, so I am not an experimentalist. I um, I do not deal with it myself. I, there are really interesting techniques that are described um, both, so um, people like Shun Karato or Dave Kolstad or have described, or Phil Skimmer as well, different coloring techniques, oxidation techniques. I'll be showing some uh, micrographs later. And I try to pay attention in these publications for what sort of, um, how they treat their samples in order to reveal this uh, density, uh, this dislocation features. Not an expert on that at all. So while I bear it in mind, I don't know the exact details of how exactly they measure it. But when we say dislocation density, I'll point this out later. Normally what we mean, I mean, again, another limitation is that we're just looking at a single plane, right? So we're seeing some projection of this three-dimensional dislocation structure uh, within the grain. And when we, what we call dislocation density is then we take the length of all these uh, dislocations that we keep on thinking as kind of lines um, and divide that total length by volume. And this is what we refer to as dislocation density. But of course, we do have to extrapolate in this third di dimension that we're not seeing um, when we're looking at them at a plane. Thank you. Yep. And um, while yep. you're still on these graphs, there's one more question um, about the stress. Uh, is that at failure? Is it max stress during deformation? Can you? Oh, great question. And I should have emphasized this more. Um, this is the, uh, so all these measurements for both of these piezometers, these are reflective of the steady state um, once the sample that's been deforming has reached the steady state. Um, so these are, you know, once you're deforming the sample, as soon as your stress stopped evolving, this is, um, this is, um, this is what's plotted here. And it's a very important point. So I mentioned it in this last point here and something I'll discuss more later. And that this is one of the, um, what sort of 
I guess, limitation or what has to be done in these experimental studies in that we, we, these studies report the steady state flow laws that we then hope to apply to various geological um, phenomena, some of which, and we do it largely for simplification because we don't always know whether the material is behaving according to its steady state flow law. It requires a relatively large, but maybe not large, but requires some finite amount of strain to actually reach the steady state conditions. And that is not always guaranteed. Things like post-seismic creep, things like um, post-glacial rebound, some activity on Earth that are small strain and relatively short-lived. Um, that's a kind of big assumption to say that the steady state flow laws would apply there. And that's what you get from it just it's very hard to measure the transient um, features. One of the other reasons we're developing these theories for is to be able to say just that. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right. So, um, and thanks for this question. They've already addressed a lot of what I have on the list here. So while it's extremely useful to have these um, kind of maps produced by the experimental data, they, of course, have some limitations. First of all, measuring this really small scale structure is um, just technically or practically uh, challenging. So we're looking at things that are micron or submicron scale. Um, and again, we're forced to look at it at the plane. Seeing through the solid rock is um, just difficult. So one challenge is just measuring and getting an accurate estimate of grain size and uh, dislocation density, especially. Isolating the effect of stress can be hard for grain size, especially. It seems to be affected by a lot of other um, things as well, like temperature or presence of water. Perhaps dislocation density is somewhat less sensitive to that. Um, another, so transient and steady state, which is discussed. Another big limitation is that when you're doing experiments in the laboratory, of course, you have to deform them at rates that are limited by your lifetime or lifetime of your PhD. Um, or, you know, your grant. At Earth-like conditions, the rocks will be deforming a lot slower. So not even talking about things like the correct pressure and temperature that experiments have been doing impressive progress with, but just the fact that on Earth, rocks deform extremely slowly. So geological phenomena occur over extremely long timescales. And the experiments, we have to deform them a lot faster. So to be able to go or infer Earth-like properties from experimental deformation um, experiments, again, this is where some of the theoretical work comes in and says what are some of the uh, what are some of the assumptions and how well justified these are. Um, all right, I'll be talking a lot about these locations. Um, one of the reasons is, like I said, um, they do seem to be a more reliable piezometer in some cases. Um, also there's abundant evidence that a lot of deformation in the deeper lithosphere and upper mantle is predominantly by dislocation creep. Um, and uh, they play a very active role in recrystallization. So how grains or other features of microstructure um, like grain size are changing. So we'll focus a lot on dislocations in this talk. When I talk about dislocations moving and evolving, uh, we'll be generally talking about two dominant ways in which uh, the dislocations move. Other ways of motion exist, but uh, I'll be focusing on these two. So one of them is climb. And for dislocation to move by climb, it needs to exchange point defects like atoms. It needs to diffuse them through the bulk of the crystal from one place to another. Here illustrated by a climber, it is a process that is relatively difficult and slow. So it's something that could occur at high temperatures, but we do not expect it to be abundant at low temperatures. Deeper lithosphere, upper mantle, dislocation climb is probably abundant as well. But in general, it's a slow process because it requires motion of atoms across the or diffusion of atoms across the bulk of the grain. Dislocations can also move by glide. It is a lot faster because you don't really need to move any matter around. You're just kind of, um, if you think of a dislocation like so, just gliding easily like an ice skater. Um, through the crystalline lattice. However, the velocity of um, 
glide is um, sensitive to presence of other dislocations. So if a dislocation line is moving through a crystal and encounters another dislocation that has a different progress vector or different geometry, um, it can get stuck, so it can be impeded. So glide, glide is highly sensitive to presence of other dislocations, which makes um, dislocation creep um, one of the things that make dislocation creep nonlinear. With that in mind, um, let's look at the, um, so we'll now be talking a lot about how the dislocation density is evolving and what that means um, for evolving microstructure in general and the strength of the rock. So again, I already mentioned that when we think about dislocations, this is just um, an example of, as you look at your crystal, these black lines here that I wish I remembered exactly what was the coloration technique here, but the, everything that's dark, uh, very dark gray or black, these are dislocation loops and lines and dipoles and so forth. Um, and you know, you count the length of all these dislocations, you divide it by volume, and that's the dislocation density. And I will always be referring to dislocation density as omega. Omega dot is the change of dislocation density through time. And I will now present to you the model that I've developed for where we combine various known sources of dislocations and we couple them with various known sinks for dislocations and we look at how dislocation density is changing through time. Okay, so the first source I'm gonna look at is called the Frank Reed source. This is the Frank, same Frank that gave us that beautiful quote about defects and rocks and people. Um, and Frank Reed works in the following way. So if you have a dislocation that happens to be pinned uh, at two points here, A and B, under the action of stress, it will tend to bow out much like a solid beam and propagate outward, creating this kind of bent loop that eventually closes in on itself. And then the process repeats because you generate another one. So by this, it's almost like um, circles on a lake. Um, I'll introduce all of the, you don't need to remember all of the terms that I'm showing here, but I just want to present you the mathematical, um, what kind of our mathematical expression for how we think of the source um, and this other uh, mechanism by which dislocation density evolves, um, just as we will need for the mathematical analysis of this. So omega one, so this is our first source, hence the plus, is evolving, um, this is just this one source, due to the action of stress, um, it is sensitive to grain size in that in order to bend this dislocation, the shorter it is, the harder it is to bend. Think of it again as a solid beam. So if your grain size is very small, there are only so many dislocations that will be long enough to be able to bend for a given stress. So this source is um, somewhat bounded by how small is your grain size. So at some point your grain size is so small, you don't have any dislocations big enough that can be deformed for that stress. VG and VC are the velocity of glide and climb that we already talked about. And because this source relies on the presence of other dislocations to keep the dislocation pinned at two points, there is this dependence on um, dislocation density as well. Okay, our next source is a grain boundary source. Again, like I mentioned, crystal grains are this um, three-dimensional features and really they're um, just because of the physics that are controlling the shape of their grain boundaries. Um, you can think of them as polygons with more or less straight edges or kind of planes. And if you want to move um, to deform this sample, these polygons with straight edges are forced to move relative to each other. And this motion has to occur in such a way that you're not opening any gaps so you don't have any overlaps, okay? Um, so it needs to be um, conforming, you know, to, um, as it accommodates strain. So in order to conform, as you deform this polycrystalline um, um, bunch of polygons together, you're introducing dislocations, what are known as geometrically necessary dislocations, uh, uh, close to the grain boundaries in order to um, not create any overlaps or gaps. So this is another dislocation source, uh, source number two. And this parameter here is what's describing um, 
kind of a, it's a it's describing the geometry along the boundary. So how many potential sources or places along the grain boundary you have where you're going to need to introduce these locations in order for um, for them to be uh, strain compatible to deform in a strain compatible way. Um, and the of course, the faster the dislocations are forced to move, the more of them you're going to be generating through time. So these are our velocities again. Um, so there are two uh, dislocation sources. I'm also going to talk about two dislocation sinks. One of them is a grain boundary sink. And that's um, here illustrated with a gliding dislocation. Same method applies if it's a climbing dislocation. As the dislocation moves through the crystal, as it reaches the grain boundary, it can be absorbed into a grain boundary in various ways. So once it is, it's exited the grain, it's no longer contributing um, to the deformation within the grain. So this is another grain boundary dislocation sink. It has a minus to it. So the more grain boundaries you have, the more efficient is this. Um, so smaller the grain size means more grain boundary in your volume. So the more grain boundaries you have, the faster your boundaries can um, swallow up these dislocations. And finally, this is our last sink, is that two dislocations can annihilate each other to a specific type of dislocation. So some dislocations form a pair where I call them, um, so they're a dipole in that um, they're, um, they have a opposite and parallel uh, Burgers vectors. So if you have two dislocations, you can think of them as two planes of atoms inserted into a crystal lattice. And if there are ones is inserted here, another one is inserted here, that can exchange atoms that make up these dislocations with each other. And in that way, through exchange of atoms, which is identical to climb, you can see these dislocations as climbing towards each other until they merge and annihilate. So the strains or stresses associated with these dislocations would then be relaxed. So this is what we know as, or we call the dipole annihilation. This is written here. So it's another sink. Um, it's predominantly governed by the velocity of climb because it requires the exchange of uh, atoms between the dislocations by diffusion. It is more sensitive to dislocation density because again, you need to find a pair. So just the probability of finding the right orientation of another dislocation um, makes it more sensitive to um, dislocation density itself. And it is um, sensitive to the grain size as well, just because if you think of a volume, um, your crystalline volume, if you have grain boundaries, um, if you have a lot of grain boundaries, there are fewer dislocations that can exchange atoms with each other. They're sort of separated by these boundaries between them. Okay, so now I've put them all together. Again, you don't have to remember all the terms that entered this equation, but I just wanted to walk you through it to show that um, this kind of differential equation that describes the evolution of dislocation density through time is made up of all these um, kind of microphysical processes that we are familiar with. And so that you could see where the dependence on stress, where the dependence on grain size, where the dependence on presence of other dislocations come in. Okay, so these are all given here. And again, just to put a more intuitive picture in your mind, you can, those of you who are old enough to remember these kind of phones and the snake game on the phone, you can think of a dislocation as the snake that is moving through the crystal and it changes its length as it encounters these various heterogeneities. And it can also interact with the boundary in that it can uh, get stuck at the boundary or be annihilated at the boundary. Okay, so sorry, before we get to that, I started this. Um, so of course we want to test this model and see where it stands with some of the known um, observations. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the piezometers. And so we want to compare the prediction of this model, for example, how dislocation density scales with stress um, that we have available from the deformation experiments. So to model a piezometer, um, because laboratory studies report what's occurring at steady state, I'm gonna set my dislocation density evolution to zero. So this is where my all my sources and sinks are in balance. Uh, so this is what's given here. So for a given grain size and dislocation density, I find the solutions to the steady states of all my combined sources and sinks of dislocations. 
And the result is plotted here. So on the y-axis, I have um, my dislocation density uh, scaled with the length of the Burgers vector. So they're both non-dimensional. And this is my stress um, scaled by the shear modulus. Um, so first I'm showing you results. So the steady state will be different depending on grain size. I'm showing you a result for where I chose a grain size of 100 micrometers. So I'm only gonna look at that one. And this line here, the dashed black line, this is the, um, so as we saw from the experiments, a lot of the experimental data seem to show a power law dependence of dislocation density on stress. So what I'm looking at here at relatively large grain size of 100 microns, I do reproduce or our model reproduces some of this power law relation. Now what happens, this color bar here is also the log 10 of the, um, of the grain sizes. If I reduce my grain size somewhat, this is now 30 microns, I still at the largest stresses, I'm reproducing this power law scaling. However, I can now see that at lower stresses, it starts to deviate from this power law behavior. And I have another steady state that is emerging and that is falling onto this straight line that are my dislocation sources at the grain boundaries. And you can sort of infer that just by looking at this equation. You can see that when grain sizes are large, these first two terms will dominate. Um, this is where the grain size is. When the grain size is smaller, these terms start to dominate. Terms that have to do with the grain boundary sources and sinks. Just because smaller grains, more uh, grain boundary um, around, and so grain boundary uh, mechanisms would be more dominant. We see that at 10 microns, the range across these um, grain boundary sources are um, dictating our piezometer is now larger. It is spanning larger um, stress range. Um, and I can do that for various grain sizes from micron or submicron to hundreds of microns. And I can see that my newly emerging piezometers are first of all, non-unique. I have a steady state piezometer here, here, and here. All of these would uh, presumably or hypothetically be um, steady states. Whether or not they're stable is something we'll revisit shortly. But what I want to draw your attention to here is that, first of all, for any of the grain sizes that we uh, tried with this model, we can reproduce the power law relation at this higher branch of our dislocation density piezometer. This is similar to what we're seeing here, again, for the same scales. However, our model predicts that there will be at small, at particular smaller stresses or arguably at smaller strain rates. And for smaller grain sizes, um, the effects of presence of grain boundaries will be important. And we have another branch of dislocation density piezometer that could also be manifested as a steady state microstructure in the rocks. Um, actually, I want to do, so one of the more kind of intuitive implication of this uh, result is that as you, as you go out in the field and you collect your sample, um, for example, you collect a sample with a really high dislocation density and Y with a really small one. Your inferred stress could then be, or if you're just looking at this upper branch, you could say that this sample must be at very high stress and the sample here would be at very low stress. While in the reality, depending on your grain size, you could, then sh you could actually be sampling the same stress, but at, um, on two different branches of the piezometer. Okay. so. I'll leave you with that um, for the dislocation and piezometers. And no, because we, um, I'm actually, I keep in track of time. Am I about 40 minutes in? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think I'm gonna need maybe another 10 minutes. Is that all right? Uh, yeah, that should bring us right to 12. So that should be good. We had some questions already. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so next I'm gonna put together what we just learned. This was the most uh, microphysically heavy part, I guess. Uh, about the dislocation density evolution. And now we're gonna look at it together with the evolving grain size. Like I said, um, all of these defects are evolving simultaneously and affect each other. Um, so I'm just gonna get right to that. Um, and this is where the title of the stock comes in is that the dislocation and grain boundaries are evolving simultaneously. So this is what I call my bar. 
and that now the evolving dislocation density and motion of boundaries uh, are together going to be dictating my microstructure. And I know I'm short on time, but I feel like this will be too sad to skip. Um, a lot of my colleagues um, quite brilliant with coming up with punchlines for this um, kind of joking title. I'm just going to take you right through that. So when dislocation, the grain boundary walk into a bar and the bartender says, and I'll show you different versions. And if you have others, feel free. Um, anything to relieve your stress. They're all puns. So I hope you're a big fan of puns. Um, and other ones, we don't serve grain alcohol, at least not at this location. Um, and I hope you're envisioning the bartender in this location, the grain boundary here. Another one, and bartender says to the grain boundary, why are you hanging out with that creep? And my personal favorite is when the bartender sighs, it's as if this establishment is inviting failure. Okay. Um, so now to more formally, we just discussed how um, dislocation density are changing through time. Let me briefly take you through what is happening at the grain boundary. So on the, on, in this equation here, I'm modeling how grain size, which is R, is changing through time, hence the dot. And it's changing through time um, due to the action of two um, forces. Uh, one of them is the surface tension. And that's when you have two grains next to each other, the larger grain has a lower surface tension and thus at a more at a lower energetic state and would tend to migrate into the smaller grain that is at a higher energetic state because it has a higher surface tension. So that's one of the forces. And the other one is the dislocation density. And that's because presence of dislocations inside the grain raises the temp oh, sorry, raises the energy, internal energy of the grain, because each dislocation is internal strain. And so the grain with the largest dislocation density will tend to be eaten up by the grain with the smaller dislocation density. And so that's a competing force. I'll remind you again, as we saw in the piezometers earlier, larger grains tend to fall on that uh, higher dislocation density piezometer, uh, piezometer branch. So larger um, grains will tend to have a larger dislocation density. Um, and this is what's uh, summarized here. The symbols are a little different because these are now non-dimensional, but these are our same sources and sinks and that capture the dependence on grain size and stress and UC and URL various velocities. So the two are now evolving together. Again, I'm going to look at what is now our predicted equilibrium state or what is our uh, steady state like we were looking at with the piezometers. And there are different, because the two um, features, a grain size and dislocation density, are evolving independently, um, or at their own time scales, they can various um, equilibrium states are possible. There's the unstable state, and that's when the slightly larger grain size, I mean, when the two grains are exactly identical, the surface tension is balanced, but one is just slightly larger, it'll just keep on eating the smaller one until it's gobbled it up entirely, and that's the unstable steady state. There is also the stable steady state, and that's when one of the grains is larger, but as it grows, it's acquiring a higher dislocation density as predicted by our piezometer, where at some point, the high dislocation density of the larger grain will offset the driving force on the boundary and stabilize it next to smaller grain, but that has a lower dislocation density. And finally, as these grains are advancing towards their steady state, because grain growth and dislocation density evolution are taking place at their own individual time scales, it may oscillate and overshoot its equilibrium state a few times before it potentially um, stabilizes. I'm going to summarize the dependence of whether you have a stable steady state, unstable steady state in this type of regime diagram. Whether or not your microstructure is stable depends um, on various parameters. Here, I'm modeling it through alpha. Alpha is what entered in this term, and it tells you how much energy is associated with the dislocations, or how big is the contribution of the dislocation density to the internal energy of the grain. So this is this alpha here. And on the x-axis is the rate at which the dislocation density can adjust, so really the velocities of the dislocations. Um, right, and so in, if you remember this color coding, blue will be stable, red is unstable, 
and then they can oscillate. So blue and green are both stable, but green is oscillatory. Um, so first I'm gonna map out what this um, um, stability diagram looks like for very small grains, like at one micron and at 50 megapascal of stress, something that you can expect um, to find at lithosphere-like conditions for different uh, tried uh, dislocation velocities or ratio of these. Um, this is our steady state dislocation density. And I'm showing you one solution, but like we saw for, um, for a given set of parameters, dislocation density can have up to three solutions. And I'm, sure I'm showing you results for the two other branches. So for a given choice of alpha or dislocation velocities, I can have three different dislocation density solutions and they each are gonna have their own stability regime. So where that system is stable or not. What does it mean that a system is unstable? Like we mentioned, it means that one grain will then keep eating other grains because the dislocation density is not high enough to offset uh, that growth. So now I'm just gonna focus on the one branch. So this is this grain that started here. And I'm going to see what happens to it if it starts off unstable, meaning it's now going to grow at the cost of the other grains. So as the system is coarsening in grain size, my regime diagram is changing and it's changing in such a way that the stability regime um, is now broader. So eventually the system transitions from small and unstable system into a coarse grained and stable system. And at this point, the forces acting on the grain boundary are balanced and the, any further uh, growth uh, of the grains will be impeded. So this um, simultaneous action of dislocation density and surface energy of the grain boundary is keeping the grains limited in size and it keeps the rocks weak just because the smaller the grain size, the more grain boundaries you have, and the easier it is for various defects to accommodate strain. So in certain conditions, the rocks will be weaker for smaller grain sizes. Um, and lastly, briefly, I'll mention on the, what this implies for the transient conditions of these rocks. So if you start off unstable, as you're evolving through time, the grain size will, um, and dislocation density, they'll oscillate if you happen to be in this regime, if it started off unstable, it'll gobble up some of the other grains and eventually stabilize um, here. This is our microphysically predicted transient behavior um, of the system as it approaches its steady state. And very quickly, I'll show you one of the implications um, of what that means. And I've applied this rheology to um, this kind of microphysical evolution to an environment of a post-seismic, um, of a seismic zone. So what can we say about a system where two plate boundaries meet? So this is a, uh, here for mega, um, where two plates meet and they, um, they're coupled. Um, and when they undergo, when an earthquake happens, the stress in the vicinity of that zone changes relatively fast. And so it takes some time for the microstructure to adjust and so the rheology of these uh, rocks in the vicinity of that zone will be changing through time. And we can model um, how that changes will happen. Um, so I'm showing it here in a very simple model where I have an elastic portion of the plate overlying a viscous portion of the plate during the locking. So right immediately before the earthquake, there is some stress that is accumulated here that uh, scales with the displacement. When then the earthquake happens and that portion of that plate rebounds and the deeper portions of the plate are trying to catch up with the motion of, uh, that is associated with the earthquake and they can only catch up as fast as the viscous part of the plate is allowing them to move. But now the viscosity or the viscous part of the plate is evolving according to our microstructural model like grain size and dislocation density. And so in case where, depending on where you are in your regime diagram or your starting conditions, the system can adjust. So the viscous part, the microstructure can adjust to its steady state relatively fast. And you can easily model that system as just rebounding or a plate gliding across the isoviscous um, lower part of the plate. However, 
if you start off at conditions where the microstructure is unstable in terms of grains and dislocation density, and the system will oscillate as it moves towards a steady state and coarsen, the, um, the rate at which you're releasing stress in this lower part of the plate and in which this upper portion can rebound will change through time in kind of non-monotonic way. Okay, so some of the take home messages, we saw that we investigated some of the microphysical um, mechanisms that are governing the strength of the plates, both on uh, long-term um, mental convection plate tectonics time scale. This is what we can characterize through steady state. And in particular, by looking at piezometers for what does the microstructure tells us about the physical conditions at this stabilized plate boundaries. We, um, we predict with this new model that both grain size and dislocation density need to be measured in order to be able to say what the stress, for example, is uh, at a given um, geological location, uh, just because of the non-uniqueness of the dislocation density piezometer. Um, we saw that the combined effect of dislocation density evolution and grain, bound, and grain growth is what can help to keep the grains small and the plate boundaries weak, again, allowing for long-lived plate boundaries, and that the transient evolution along these plate boundaries can be, we can model a lot of these evolving rheological properties using the same uh, microphysical model. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Uh, thank you, and sorry if I went a bit out of time. I'll take any questions. Thank you. A lot for everyone. Um, yes, do we have any questions for Alvira? I saw one. Uh, Sarah Arvidsson, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Hi, Alvira. Um, Hi. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you started off this talk talking about habitability. So I'm just curious if you could tie this all back to that. Right. Um, great question. And I know I'll browse through it a little too quickly. Um, so in order for a planet um, to be habitable, um, there are a number of things that need to be in place. So one of them, for example, um, is the stability of the climate. And to tie that, um, how that ties to plate tectonics is that because we have this continuous motion of rocky layers along the surface um, that is helping to bring up fresh um, minerals to the Earth's surface that can then react with the ocean and the atmosphere. And that sets up uh, some of the negative feedbacks in terms of the budget of uh, greenhouse gases, for example, like hydrogen and carbon. And in this way, this continuously changing mineralogy of the Earth's surface and its feedbacks with the atmosphere and ocean is one of um, the hypothesized um, uh, kind of stabilizing effects on our climate. Stable climate is something that um, we need to have for, you know, for a biological system to have time to evolve. Another is um, if you have this mobilized surface like you have with the plate tectonics, the rate at which the planet can cool, um, which is what's happening by mantle convection, if, the, if you can easily, relatively easily, if you have this whole scale of overturn of hot material from the mantle to the surface and then back down, it cools the planet at a fast enough rate that deeper down where you have your core, the Core can be core can only cool as fast as the mantle can carry that heat away. So if the mantle is cooling rapidly because it has this uh, help or mobilized surface, the core is cooling rapidly. And that means the, this cooling rate of the core is what's controlling how fast the convective motions in the outer core liquid are happening, which allows for a magnetic field to exist or an active dynamo on our planet. Um, this is, for example, one of the hypothesized differences between say Earth and Venus. So e Venus does not have a, an observable or a strong enough magnetic field. And one of the uh, possible reasons is that because its surface on Venus is relatively immobile, or at least it's not continuously deforming, that the interior of that planet is too hot for the core to be able to convect or the outer portion of the core uh, to be conducting fast enough to generate the dynamo. While on Earth, because the mantle is cooler, the core is cooling faster and they have a dynamo. 
And this geomagnetic field that that sets up is protecting us from some of the solar radiation. Again, something that is helping for the life to evolve and for the planet to be habitable. Um, so those are two examples. Did that answer your question? I know it was a little lengthy. Yeah, thank you. And maybe I'll follow up with you later. And the other quick question I had was if you had looked at sort of how this applies to maybe length scales and time scales of, of ices, different ices and icy bodies. I said, oh, great question. Question. Um, so this is definitely a very exciting venue to compare. Um, this is somewhat tied to the earlier question we got of um, whether we're looking at the mafic rocks or maybe some of the um, crustal rocks and different materials in general. So a lot of the physical theory that I'm basing my model on comes from metallurgical studies, like looking at metals. Uh, just because the engineering field has been looking at this problem for a long time and they have um, so different solid materials can shed light on these different processes that are occurring there are a lot of similarities like solids because they're organized um, crystals they have rain boundaries they have dislocations that respond to stress and temperature in various ways a lot of similarities but there are also a lot of uh, important differences. So for the ice in particular, I'm not an expert on ice by any means, but it is also one of the materials that tends to localize uh, stress or strain, same as um, our kind of uh, minerals tend to do. Um, and to be highly nonlinear, the rheology of the ice is highly nonlinear, presumably maybe also due to the way the dislocations are non-linearly scaling with stress and there is velocity, how it scales with stress. What makes ice super complicated is that I think the transition to melting. So if you're looking at the polycrystalline chunk of ice, as its grains are gonna start deforming, I'm not entirely sure what is happening at their grain boundaries. And something that's emerging the more we look at the rocks is that the effect of the grain boundaries is quite strong. And the grain boundaries in minerals and the grain boundaries in ice um, I think can behave quite differently just because the ice grain boundaries could be more melt-like. Um, but that's a speculation. They do have a lot of similarities. They are highly nonlinear. They tend to localize uh, shear or strain, but there are a lot of important differences as well, um, like the grain boundaries. If you have any other thoughts on like something we could take advantage of, you know, parallel studies of ice and minerals, I'd be super curious about that. And uh, Joyce Sim had asked a question earlier about why geologically um, dead planets were bad for our habitability, but I think <laughs> that, but she can chime in if there was more to that question. And Sarah adds that uh, glaciologists and ice physicists might have done a lot of the work on H2O and ice for you uh, about this. Yeah. I actually, I should mention for the ice, I think Europa is one of the moons, is one of the very exciting places to, for I think either already plans or maybe in the works of space missions, just because there is this ice tectonics happening on Europa that perhaps resembles the plate tectonics on Earth somewhat. So there's definitely exciting parallels between the two materials. I haven't personally looked into it too much, but I'd be curious too. Yeah, for sure. Um, there was a question earlier, sorry, I'd missed it, uh, from Nicholas Brentet, who I don't see anymore on the call, but it was, uh, he was asking, is there experimental or observational evidence maybe in metals for the lower branch of dislocation density versus stress curve? So I think uh -huh. that's from your prediction, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So I think in order to see that, um, in order to be able to confidently say that um, the dislocation, then, that the piezometer measured from the lab uh, reproduces the slower branch, one, the deformation will have to be happening, um, so I should start this differently. In the lab, there is a process of recrystallization that will be happening simultaneously that is currently not taken into account in our model. And in particular, is the formation of subgrains and formation of new grains by, by subgrain rotation. 
So once you deform the sample in the laboratory and you're looking at your uh, microstructure, you will have some larger grains uh, with a given dislocation density within them, but you'll also have small grains that will be devoid of dislocations. And in our theory, we so our theory would then predict that this is because the grains are small and therefore their dislocation density is low or even um, kind of dictated by the grain boundaries. But it would be difficult to isolate that effect from this grain just being a newly formed um, subgrain that's rotated to become a new grain, which also tends to be dislocation free. So I think we'll, it will definitely be interesting to, um, to kind of look in more detail at the microstructures reported uh, from the deformation experiments to see even for the, for the smaller grains. So normally what we see is just some mean grain size or some mean dislocation density. It would be very interesting to see, you know, kind of more specifically, what is the size of the grain and their individual dislocation density, and then see whether um, that lower branch is there. What is observed is that small grains tend to be dislocation poor. So that's an agreement with our theory. But whether it's due to the processes we presented or due to this additional process of forming subgrains that are also dislocation free, that is not in our model that we'll need to, um, to be able to distinguish first. So it's, um, it's in the works, but um, at the moment, the theory doesn't disagree with the experimental data, but it also, um, we can't say that it confirms it either, just because we need to single out this other process of subgrains. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions at the back? don't see any. We feel free to unmute if I've missed your question. Uh, but if not, let's thank Elvira again uh, for this great talk. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me. And